Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk of London's most notorious and often forgotten murder cases, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is a guided walk of one of Soho's strangest murders, as what initially seemed to the police like a simple double homicide was anything but. And to those who made money from crime, it would typify how fragile life as a gangster can be. Murder Mile contains vivid descriptions, which may not be suitable for those of a sensitive disposition, as well as photos, videos and maps, which accompany this series, so that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I'm your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 2, Double Murder at the Bus Stop Club. Today, I'm standing on the south side of Dean Street in Soho W1, in London's infamous West End. Measuring roughly one square mile, and bordered by Oxford Street, Regent Street, Shaftesbury Avenue and Charing Cross Road, Soho is the cultural home of the West End a district synonymous with artists, writers and musicians, such as Charles Dickens, Karl Marx, Francis Bacon, Lucian Freud, George Melly, The Beatles, The Who, Elton John, Queen, Eric Clapton, Brian Jones, Mozart and David Bowie, to name but a few. As well as infamous clubs, such as the Marquee Club, Ronnie Scott's, Billy's, the Shim Sham Club, the Flamingo Club and the Whiskey A Go-Go. But of course... What Soho is most famous for is sex. Over the last 200 years, Soho has been the beating heart of London's seedy sex trade, to such an extent that by the early 1960s, when this episode takes place, Soho was home to over 300 strip clubs, clip joints, gambling dens and brothels, meaning that on some of its seedier streets, almost every door had a buzzer, a red light, and a handwritten sign pointing upstairs, which simply read, Models. And having such a roller coaster history of ever-changing fortunes, shifting from chic to slum and back again within the same century, Soho was the place to come for drugs, booze, and sex. One such place in the early 1960s was innocently called the bus stop. And although a period of modern gentrification has attempted to eradicate Soho's seedy history, the unsubtle hints are still dotted about here and there. Featuring the last of the sex shops, flesh pots, porn theatres and suspiciously empty studio flats, which are still rented out by the month, the week, the day and even by the hour. And although today, Dean Street is a heavily sanitised version of its former self, covered by a swathe of trendy eateries, upmarket restaurants and hip juice bars. No matter how quickly they build, how fast they paint or how hard they scrub, nothing will wash away the memory of the Soho gangster who stained Dean Street red with blood. His name was Tony Meller. Italian-born, but raised in Croydon, South London, 37-year-old Antonio Benedetta Mella, known locally as Big Tony, was, as his name would suggest, tall, well-built and muscular. He sparred with the infamous enforcer for the Richardson gang, Mad Frankie Fraser, and was feared and respected. Although, in his youth, he was regarded as a half-decent boxer with some ability... He lacked the technique, the courage and the aptitude to go professional. Tony Meller was nothing more than a dirty fighter who shunned the rules, shirked his morals and always hit below the belt. Inside the ring, he was undisciplined, violent and dangerous. But outside, on Soho's seedy streets, Tony Meller was tough, rough and nasty. 
as well as easily one of the best and dirtiest street fighters around. A skill which would come in handy, as Tony Meller ruffled feathers and reneged on deals. Having risen through the ranks of Soho's criminal underworld, Meller was a much feared gangster whose primary business was hostess bars and clip joints. Commonly known as near beer clubs, clip joints of a grey area of the extortion racket where customers are lured into sleazy off-street sex clubs that are hidden in dark-lit basements with the promise of nude girls, cold beers and maybe a little something extra with a lady. None of which would ever happen as the girls were off limits, the beer was weak and the only little extra the customer would get was an extortionate bill, an empty wallet and a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to leave the premises without two broken legs. In the West End alone, Tony Meller, who it is said didn't have an honest bone in his body, owned over 30 clip joints as he skirted the law, making a very tidy profit for himself and never once giving a single thought for anyone else but himself. One such club, owned by Tony Meller, was at 48 Dean Street. Having procured the three-story premises from its slightly scared owner, using a fistful of notes, but mostly his fists. It was called the Grill Club, later renamed the Bus Stop, which comprised of a law-abiding cafe on the ground floor, a drinking den serviced by scantily clad ladies in the basement, and comfortable offices above for himself, and later the club's manager and his lifelong friend, Alfred Melvin. As a word to describe Tony Meller, selfish was an understatement. Rude was too kind, and deceitful he'd probably deem as a compliment. As whether punters or pals, rivals or those he should really have respected, Meller would happily stiff anyone over a few pounds. And having ruffled one too many feathers amongst Soho's criminal fraternity, he also had the scars to prove it. His body was a patchwork of slits, stabs and slashes, from old unsettled scores, as he humiliated his friends in a desperate bid to prove that he was top dog. Across his face and chest, the fragments of a smashed whiskey bottle were still embedded, having stepped out of line in the presence of London's criminal kingpin, Billy Hill. Across his back and wrists were six slashes by an unknown booze peddler who he'd stiffed over a shipment. And across his bottom was an injury impossible to forget. As having double-crossed a Soho conman, over a complicated con involving coin-operated one-armed bandits, who was also a much-lauded dwarf tag-team wrestler. Yes, you heard me correctly. A dwarf tag-team wrestler by the name of Fuzzy K. Mella spat out a mouthful of spiteful curses at his pint-sized partner, having first bent down to humiliate further his height-restricted pal amidst a bar full of their friends. And then he proceeded to laugh in the little man's face. <laughs> Fuzzy K, being barely four foot two inches tall, but a sturdily built tough guy who could easily handle himself in or out of the ring, slashed Mella across the bottom with a very sharp bayonet scoring each buttock with long, bloody lines, like his arse was a noughts and crosses board. It is said that Tony Mello didn't sit down for a week. And yet, being big, brash and bull-headed, he didn't learn his lesson. In July 1951, having stepped out of line once again, and shown a severe lack of loyalty to the crime boss Billy Hill. Mello was paid a little visit by his old boxing partner, the aptly named Mad Frankie Fraser, who although just five foot and five inches tall, 
and standing almost half a foot shorter than Tony. During his lifetime, he would spend almost 42 years in prison for bank robbery, murder, and his own personal speciality, torture. Pinning Mella to the floor of his flat in Old Street, Mad Frankie Fraser pulled out his trusty flick knife, clicked open the four-inch blade, and set about hacking and slashing at Mella's flesh, like a man possessed. During the attack, Mella lost four pints of blood and a rather nice suit to boot. But did he die? No. He could have. He should have. But he didn't. Mad Frankie Fraser was a professional. And besides, this wasn't a murder. This was a message. A blunt calling card that said, cross over the line again, and you're dead. After a few days in Whitechapel Hospital, his sliced up corso held together by a few dozen stitches, Mella was out. But not before he'd claimed to the trashy tabloid newspapers that he'd been set upon by six rivals who'd held him down and had cut him over a hundred times. Outside, he was desperate to be seen as a bad boy, a feared felon and a master gangster whose manner his rivals were eager to muscle in on. But inside, he was scared for his life. Tony Mella needed a bodyguard. He needed protection. And so he turned to the one man he knew he could trust. An old pal from his boxing days in Mile End Arena. Alfred Melvin. Alfred Melvin, known simply as Big Alf to his friends, was a gentle giant. Six foot tall and half as wide. With a boxer's broken face and a soft heart in a hard frame who could silence a room simply by walking in, who could settle a debt with a firm hand on a nervous shoulder, and who could pacify a problem punter just by giving them a look. And yet, Big Alf always had a smile, a whistle and a song. And what he couldn't solve with his fists, he could overcome with his sheer size and his charm. Being more than a decade older than Tony Mellor, Alfred Melvin's boxing days were most definitely over, not only owing to far too many knocks to his head, cracks to his ribs, and a waistline which could no longer be described as fighting fit. But with his heart no longer being into boxing, Big Alf had set himself up as a florist. And although a life with his beloved wife, surrounded by roses, tulips and pansies, was a far cry from the exciting world of being a semi-professional pugilist. It was safe, calm, and best of all, it paid the bills. Or oh, it did, for a while at least. But around the time that Mad Frankie Fraser was using Tony Mellor's chest as a cutting board, Big Al's floristry shop was struggling financially, and he needed money fast. One week later, Alfred Melvin was hired as the personal bodyguard of Tony Mellor. It was a job he would hate, a job he would resent, and a job he would live to regret. As having failed to learn his lesson, and now feeling he'd got a hulking great friend to protect him, Mellor continued being the bastard he always was. Sly, rude, crude, and obnoxious. A discourteous man with no manners, morals, or sense of respect as all the while, the ever-loyal Big Alf was watching his back. Ten years later, by the end of 1962, with money even tighter and his florist shop having gone out of business, Alfred Melvin was still working to Tony Mellor as his bodyguard, but also as the club's manager, and so he thought, his partner. Having recently purchased the three-storey building at number 48 Dean Street, which he'd renamed the Bus Stop Club, it was entirely owned by Mellor, but the day-to-day -day running of Soho's newest clip joint was managed by Alfred Melvin. As a boss, Big Alf was a sweetie. Polite, proud and punctual, 
with a swift sharp right hook to any drunken punter who dare manhandle his dancing girls, many of whom had come to London on the promise of a glittering West End career as a dancer, having been duped into giving a personal audition on the second floor casting couch to Tony Mella. Although a business of dubious morals, which skirted the law, Big Alf ran the clip joint like it was a family business. Everyone was looked after, everyone was cared for, and everyone was paid on time, even if the money came from Alf's own pocket, none of which he could really afford. By January 1963, just a few short months since the bus stop's launch, with the often absent Tony Meller reneging on deals, shafting suppliers, and siphoning off cash from his club to live a lavish lifestyle of a big-time gangster. And even though the club was in profit, Big Alf was £300 down. £300, which is just shy of £5,000 in today's money. Maybe that's not a huge fortune, but for a man with a wife, kids, a house, and a history of bad debts, it was enough to cripple Alf. And yet, along with every other promise that Tony Mella had made to his friend, the promise to pay him all the money back, the promise of a partnership in the business, and the promise of a share of the club's profits, and as much as big-hearted Alfred Melville believed that he would, Tony Mella never kept his promises. On the evening of the 28th of January 1963, just before 11pm, on a quiet Monday night at the bus stop club, as barely a handful of punters watched a stripper lightly wiggle her tassels, entirely unaware of the extensive bill which they were about to be handed for the pleasure of buying a dancer a woefully watered-down drink, which was about as boozy as a breath mint. The punters suddenly became distracted, not by the girly action on stage, but by the unmanly action off stage. As with voices raised, chests inflated, and tempers flared, Big Alf bid the bullet and demanded his money. The club fell silent. And slowly, amidst the deafening silence in the seedy basement of 48 Dean Street, Tony Meller began to laugh. <laughs> not jokingly, not warmly, not even naturally, but sinisterly, savagely and spitefully, right back in his friend's face. It was almost as if the last 12 years had never happened. Being stitched with a whiskey bottle by Billy Hill, being crisscrossed across the buttocks by Fuzzy K, the dwarf wrestler, and having his chest sliced apart by Mad Frankie Fraser and his trusty flick knife. It was never repeated what Tony Meller said to Alfred Melvin that night, but by those who heard it, all agreed. It was classic Tony Meller. Rude, spiteful and humiliating as he cruelly goaded his friend to beg, as he knew he was too nice to fight, too smart to retort, and too broke to quit. The last time that Alfred Melvin was seen alive was in his first floor office at 48 Dean Street at a little before 11.15pm as he sat writing a letter. When questioned by the police, a waiter at the China Rose restaurant opposite the bus stop confirmed that he'd heard lots of shouting and noise, followed by four loud pops. Initially, the police suspected that this was simply an old-style gangland killing, as rival gangsters tried to muscle in on Tony Meller's patch, as during that era, different gangs were engaged in a never-ending series of turf wars, and regardless of who you were, you always risked being rubbed out by anyone at any time for any reason, as life for a Soho gangster was as messy as it was short. 
But the police knew that this wasn't a hit, and neither was his business. Now this was personal. At 11.15 p.m., on Monday the 28th of January 1963, through the front door of 48 Dean Street, Tony Mella burst. Staggering into the street, having been shot three times in the back, the first bullet punctured his lung. The second ripped through his stomach. His hand struggling to stem the flow of blood. And the third bullet nicked a small hole in what was supposedly his heart. Antonio Benedetta Mella collapsed just shy of Romilly Street, barely 20 feet from the door, and died face down in the gutter his last few pints of blood pumping into the street, staining it red. On the first floor of the club, the police found Alfred Melvin in his office, sat upright in his armchair, a single bullet having entered under his chin and blasted a large hole through his head, blowing his brains up their newly decorated wall. At his feet, lay a small calibre browning pistol with his fingerprints on the butt and the trigger and in his breast pocket a freshly written note to his beloved wife and now his widow. It simply read, I've been a drunken mug. This bastard Tony Meller has used me. I've come into this world with nothing and I'm going out with nothing. Supposedly that evening a police constable from West End Central ran into the station, excitedly shouting, There's a party in Soho tonight! Tony Meller's dead! As being so despised by both the police and gangsters alike, Meller was not going to be missed. But the same could not be said for Big Alf. A few days later, both men's funerals were held. Tony Mellers in Manor Park Cemetery and Alfred Melvin's in Battersea. And as mourners struggled to find space to pay their last respects to big-hearted Alf, the turnout to Tony Mellers' funeral was sparse. And yet, in a humble act of forgiveness, Mellers' wife sent a floral wreath to Melvin's funeral, and vice versa. No malice was ever held between the two women, and the £300 debt, which had ended their husbands' lives, was cancelled. But before either men were buried, Tony Meller's business was already being carved up by his rivals, and before too long, Antonio Benedetta Meller, the self-proclaimed King of Soho, had already been forgotten. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. If you enjoyed this episode, please do rate us and subscribe to the Murder Mile podcast on iTunes, and also like us and share us with your friends. And if you're in London, why not take part in Murder Mile Walk? It's my guided walk of Soho's most infamous murder cases, featuring 12 murderers across 15 locations, totaling 75 mysterious deaths, all in just over one mile. Tickets are available via my website, murdermiletours.com. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Next week's episode is The Baby Batterer of Bedfordbury. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. <laughs>